This episode of Off Color is brought to you by The Three Leeches. Theater for under $1,000 that doesn't suck. The Three Leeches are hosting a very special fundraiser this January 27th at The Cube, which is located in Northfield. For more information, visit www.3leeches.com. You are listening to Off Color, a podcast where 1.5 black people and James talk about race and help you learn how to talk about race and racism, hopefully. I'm Rebecca Henderson. I'm the point five. I'm Dr. Gregory Diggs, 1.0. I'm James. And this is Off Color. No. All right. Good evening. Welcome to Off Color. I'm really excited about tonight's episode because we have a very special guest with us tonight. And he is probably one of the most famous people in Denver, I would say. Uh-huh. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I present Theo Wilson. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I have my intros and you work. Okay. So, <laughs> Theo, welcome hey. to my basement. And I would like to ask you maybe a couple questions, if you don't mind. Like, I'm not sure. I feel like a lot of people already know who you are. Okay. Um, But for people who maybe do not know who you are, mm. can you just tell us, like, a little bit about yourself? You know, just give me, give me the scoop on Theo Wilson. Well, I was born here in Denver, the Park Hill area when I was born, where we sitting was still a runway for the airport. Mm. Um, I just grew up uh, and um, went to George Washington High School, mm. Florida A&M University, uh, where I went on an art scholarship, and then mm. I got a theater degree from there oh. and began acting immediately afterwards. And um, I decided that acting didn't matter to me as much as activism, so... Mm. I found a bridge between those two worlds, which was slam poetry, where you could mm. perform and talk about the things that matter. So ended up winning National Poetry Slam and did a couple tours and TED Talks, and here I am. Mm. Wow, excellent. One of the things, because um, I knew about you from Slam Nuba. That's uh-huh. where I had seen you before, mm-hmm. I think. And But also something that you kind of, you gained a lot of... Um, press or your video your TED talk was it just your TED talk that went viral or was it was your video I have Can you several, talk about that a little yeah bit? so um I've been micro viral uh with a few videos uh about reparations black lives matter topics and whatnot and that is what propelled me into the uh the all right a little bit because they didn't like what I was talking about and they began to troll my videos and call me all kinds of N-words and all kinds of stuff. And I said, you know, rather than arguing with them, let me figure out what's at the root cause of this. So it caused me to just, I, I didn't think it was nothing. I'm telling y'all, I didn't think it was nothing when I did it. It was just, I, I set up a fake profile on YouTube and uh, started trying to trick the algorithm to give me more videos that I didn't like. Just so I could see what they were talking about. But then I set it down and I never thought I'd ever have it see the light of day. So when Ted came to me and was like, can you do a talk instead of a poem? I, I, it was a micro topic, bro. It was a very small piece of the original script. Seven revisions later, it was the freaking main focus of the script. All right. And so that's what ended up doing it. Yeah. And that's it, excellent. And it went viral. Yeah. How long did you do that for? The fake profiles and stuff like that? It's it's, it's a rough estimate between six and eight months. Oh. The, yeah, and I mean, you know, I had other stuff going on in, in in my life, you know what I'm saying? Like, I had a job and girlfriend and all that, and, you know, I had to figure out what this poetry thing looked like. But I would go online, and then there it was, just staring me in the face. And I was like, well, let me figure out what's happening. So, yeah, about six to eight months. And it was the Ku Klux Klan? The alt-right. <clears throat> alt-right. But it's oh. basically the Ku Klux Klan. I wish they almost would stop calling yeah. it the alt-right, because I'm not, not even almost. I wish they would stop and just say yeah. what it is, because alt-right yeah. makes it sound like, oh, we're just a little alternative to the right mm-hmm. wing. Mm-hmm. But hello, you're like murdering and terrifying people, yeah. and yeah. I yeah. don't like this mainstreaming of it. Yeah. 
Did you work on it just on YouTube or was it on, were you on Stormfront and stuff like that? I went to those websites for, yeah, yeah. for sure. Like I, I went to Stormfront, American Renaissance, uh, National Vanguard Alliance. I was there. Wow. Um, just picking up their bullet points and the things that they cared about and seeing if I could find some common threads. And I found, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very dark rabbit hole. You go down there and you figure out that this beast been with America since America been America and mm -hmm. before. You know what I'm saying? This this um <clears throat> this new era, we like to trick ourselves into thinking that this ain't been an apartheid country since 1492. You wow. know what I'm saying? Come on. So now. <laughs> you know, it's it's just one of those things where it, it comes back into your awareness, and um, yeah, I kind of baptized myself in it. I, I kind of traumatized myself. I didn't realize you know what I was carrying around with me until I had to talk about it all over the country. Mm. So yeah. Did any of the people that you engage with did they move? As a part of your engagement, or what, what do you mean, move like from their racist, you know? Yo, that's, that's an interesting question, bro. Um, I don't think anybody remembers Lucius 25. Uh, if they do, it's, it's very marginal. I didn't make a lot of waves, I was just watching, you know, okay. what I mean? commenting a little bit, okay, to get some more feedback. But what happened after the TED talk hit, there was, uh, there was three versions of the of the talk out four actually one on facebook two on youtube and another one on ted okay one of the ones on youtube got trolled hard by the alt right yeah hard i'm talking about at least a 50 percent downvote rate you know what i'm saying and they really went in but then i got these inboxes about these guys talking about listen man you really made me question some things and I'm no longer down with that kind of thinking. You kind of open my eyes, like, wow. and this is like, like this happens more than I even let out. I don't even say it, I, but I, I got all the uh, letters and you know back channels that that you can think of about these folks leaving that way of thinking. So yeah, it was it was deep. It was the TED talk that did it, not the actual undercover work. Yeah, yeah, that's powerful, man. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you know. I don't like, you know, I don't want to put that up in front of everybody like, hi, making people leave white supremacy. Well, yeah. <laughs> what have you done today? <laughs> <laughs> but like, it's happening, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, well, that's part of even the purpose of us coming together and yeah. talking because we're starting to believe that sometimes you just got to get in there. Yeah. You just got to get but, in there and have a conversation. Okay, so my question about that, uh, something happened to me, Not nothing really happened, but... Like, I, I wouldn't have, I feel like, the courage to be able to engage with that, me me personally. And I'd like to think that I would, you know. I'm like, oh, I'm mixed race, and I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm, I'll talk to anyone. But last week I was at the gym, and I saw this dude, and I thought, hmm, that guy looks like maybe he's like a white supremacist. And then I was going to get ready to take a picture of him Right, like on the slide, to like as like a joke almost to be like, this is guy white supremacist or what, you know, or something. He turned around and the back of his shirt had this message on it, and it said, "All we want is total war." So we want the total, we, total war. war. And yeah. I looked at that, <clears throat> and I thought, I don't know what that means. And I'm like, I'm like, maybe he really is like a like a legit like white supremacist. So I'm like googling, mm -hmm. and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm tweeting, and James here was like. Yeah, 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 yeah. That guy's a white supremacist. Mm -hmm. And it was just, that was not a situation where I would have been like, maybe I should go talk to that guy who's punching the bag all <clears> hard <throat> and like yeah. crazy. And I'm there in my gold fanny pack mm -hmm. feeling nervous. You know what I mean? I mean, I think my sense of danger got skewed because I, I survived a police brutality incident uh. right after I uh, graduated college, no less. I had a college degree. And uh, the fight broke out in a nightclub that didn't even involve me. Next thing I know, um, in the melee, uh, I'm, I'm getting arrested, thrown on the ground, and taken upstairs. Uh, so, because I started screaming, like, police brutality. So, everybody would turn around, and they did. Mm. And, like, once everybody started looking at the police, like, I guess they got nervous and they took me into this back room up these stairs, and I thought I was going to die. Mm. And I said, I seen this movie, and the black dude don't make Ooh. it out. So, they handcuffed Ooh. me to the chair, started beating me. And, and so I was just like, okay, well, after that, nothing's really that much scarier. Wow. So that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Mm. That's just what happened. So I mean, I I, I live with that, and 
you know, I, I buried it way deep down in my heart and kept moving because so many brothers that I know had got beat up by the police too. Yeah. I didn't feel like, like, I know brothers that got beat way worse than I got beat. Right. So I didn't think that this was nothing that, you know what I'm saying, like the, 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 the language of post-traumatic stress and all that, that wasn't in the mainstream culture. So we smoked a couple blunts and kept it pushing. You know what I'm saying? But then when Eric Garner and them started getting uh, killed, like Eric Garner specifically got yoked up very similarly to how I got yoked up. So that just popped open the wound and the survivor's guilt. And then my boy Alonzo Assey got killed by the police. So I got a different sense of danger. <laughs> you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So when, when I'm doing stuff online, you know, I'm like, <laughs> say what you want. <laughs> in front yeah, of your but computer, would bro. you, I guess my question though is like, for as far as trying to engage with people or push those conversations, I don't know. It's like, would you talk to that guy at my gym? Would you want to talk to him? I probably wouldn't initiate the conversation just off the strength of, I mean, I got a day to move on with too. You know what I'm right. saying? Mm. Right. But right. If, if it was a controlled environment and, and, and Buddy wanted to speak, I'm not going back right. down from the conversation. Right. I would establish some like ground ground rules and whatnot, but I'm not going to walk up to Buddy. You know what I mean? Because like I, I've been in situations where I'm like in the backwoods, you know what I'm saying? And folks walking with Confederate flags on their hat. You know what I mean? You a black man, you outnumbered. So what's your choices here? You know what I mean? So it's just like, say what you say, but keep that stuff over there. Because if you come over here with it, I'm about to break you off. You know, and but and then I, I I leave it there. Like I have a non-engagement policy, but mm-hmm. if, if you engage, then it is what it is. But a conversation I'm willing to have under the right circumstances. But oh, what right. I have initiated, probably not. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, ruin my New Year's resolution because I have not been back to the gym since. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. <laughs> Got a wicked Aryan in there, punching <laughs> shit hella hard. It was just, you know what I mean. It was really, it was, a, it was a lot for me. And I feel like you've seen that dude. You said you think you've seen him. Well, that's baby. why I knew. I saw her tweet describing him, and I immediately knew who he was because I saw him at the barber shop two years ago where he's clearly fond of that shirt because I, wow. rem- I remember the shirt same shirt Sammy mm-hmm. 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 And, and I looked it up and, mm. and I didn't know this but I guess that quote is from a Goebbels speech Goebbels. and mm. uh, it's a reference to another uh, there's a whole bunch it's, of stuff yeah. I so didn't anyway, know that it's I actually know that. some kind of alt-right uh, white supremacist um like bro gym, like in Tennessee bro or something. Gym. Wow. And I guess it has a whole sort of um, CrossFit kind of cult yeah, like built yeah. around it, but it's specifically about like, I guess, Ringing preparedness people. for the race war or whatever. Um, but Damn, but I, I didn't yeah. know. I did not know See? that. But that yeah. And you go to that gym too. Yeah. That's your gym. That's our gym. Yeah. <laughs> well, what gym is it? <laughs> no. Just. Oh. I don't know if we should be saying the name of the gym. Okay, cool. It's in the it. neighborhood. We'll talk. We'll talk. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Avoid it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to say the name of the white supremacist group either. Uh, I'm not trying to give it any amplification. Okay, yeah, no. But but I was wondering about that situation. Did make me wonder: Have you in public run into anything that? Um, maybe prior to you doing this research, you wouldn't have recognized the symbolism or the name of something as like a subtle alt-right and then you encountered it and 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 based on your education from finding out about that, knew what you were looking at? No, nah, not in public, just online. Like yeah. certain things, certain cold, cold words, um, Pepe the Frog, mm-hmm. word mm-hmm. cuck and all them. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? I, I didn't know nothing about that. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I just kept noticing that all these different people kept showing me the same memes mm-hmm. and the same lingo and the same fake facts mm-hmm. that I said, okay, why are y'all getting this from? Right. Because this seemed like as it's a wellspring of misinformation yeah. that multiple people are, are throwing at me to try to debate me. I was able to crush it from one person, but then when the hell of people started throwing the same stuff, so not in public, brother, mm-hmm. but online, certainly. Um, like... Yeah, just certain tattoos I can recognize now. Wow. Certain books now. Like if you he like if you ever see the book Camp of the Saints around, mm. you you know you in enemy territory. You know what mm. I'm saying? Camp of the Saints specifically is an interesting, yeah, mm. manifesto. It's, All a, right. it's a newer thing or no? I've never nah, heard of that. <clears throat> Camp of the Saints was written in seventy four. What it did was uh it the full title is uh something like a terrifying tale of the end of the white race. And what mm-hmm. it's about was back then a hypothetical scenario where 800,000 people from India moved into France. And uh, it's a very racist book. But it, the leader of the uh, the Indian people was codenamed Turd Eater. 
Mm. And this fool was like, you know, just the vilest thing. And the only way to get them out of there was total war. So it was a full on uh, attempt at genocide in the book. Steve Bannon used to reference it a lot on his podcast. Wow. Mm. Steve Bannon used to talk about it a lot. And then when you he when you see the influx of Arab and African people into Europe right now, they are calling it a camp of the Saint scenario. Wow. You know what I'm saying? I so, did not know that. Yeah. So wow. you ever look out for camp of the saints, that's one of them things you gotta understand. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you know, stuff little stuff like that. Yeah. Little uh, stuff. I, I'm, yeah, I, I figured out online, but yeah. I well, so appreciate that because, yeah. you know, I mean, that's why we talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's up. what we talk. <laughs> that's we have, we have put out the PSA. <clears throat> yeah, Bannon was. Wow. Terrible guy. <laughs> terrible human being. At least, I mean, in, in no, my No, no, we went to Yeah, you're not getting any arguments. <laughs> yeah, <from here. laughs> I wasn't like, I love Steve Bannon. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Well, although it is a little funny to see now in light of this book, yeah. all of a sudden, like, the Twitter left <laughs> does like Steve Bannon because now he doesn't like Trump. And yeah, so, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, Bannon's always been for self. Mm-hmm. He's, he's always been an opportunist, man. I mean, it's just what it is. He's somebody who is a Machiavellian thinker, and he does things uh, of wicked self-interest. So, yeah, you know, right. this actually isn't surprising. Mm-hmm. There's no honor among these thieves. And, That's right. You know, honor takes things like, I don't know, principles, mm-hmm. self-control, discipline, you know, a path that you've walked for a while that makes this person a comrade. And this is not what you see in the Trump administration. So. No, not yeah. at all. Uh, well, we yeah, see it as a so. damn nightmare. And, yeah. um, <clears throat> I keep hoping I'm going to wake up and I never do. I'm still, yeah. every day, I'm like, oh, this yeah. is still happening. Yeah. This, this Great. has to play out. This well, has to play out. Okay. Yeah, I know. We have been talking about that too, where in like, in some ways, it's almost, I, I really struggle with saying that it's like a blessing, you know? I can't really say that. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I'm with you. Yeah, I, I would, do I feel like, from in my personal life, I feel like now, I've been like taking no prisoners, right? And I just, Mm. I feel like things that happen, things I used to let slide, I don't let slide anymore. Mm. Like I'm pretty, Mm -hmm. and I I feel like that's just how we have to be now. Yeah. Like there's no room for it because when, because I think of all the times I let people say like racist stuff or do racist Mm. things or da, 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 and I didn't say anything. I feel like I made way for this. Right. For what's happening now. We we all did in some way. There, there, There was not, no way that we could really see this future unless you understood the the patterns to look for, but how many of us are really schooled in history like that? One of the ways that I saw the alt right resurgent was they don't teach history correctly. In this right, country. they just mm-hmm. don't like everything mm-hmm. is right. fully decontextualized. Mm-hmm. Like even when they try to honor history, for example, Dr. Martin Luther King Day, they present it in this distant, far off, black and white sepia tone, yeah, packaged McDonald's way. That makes it look like, well, that was then and this is now. And aren't you glad that we moved past yeah. that? You know, and so, of course, the white kids specifically in this country, um, you know, and I guess black kids, too, for real, you know, mm-hmm. don't really get that. You know, hold on. The last Jim Crow law fell in 1971. Right. It was right. openly it's not that long apartheid ago. since 1776 right. and before. Yeah. So we've only been... 45, 46 years out of this, Yeah, that doesn't spell... Food. And I'm not sure how far out of it we are because yeah. we've got an attack on voting rights now. Yeah. Even in Denver, if you talk about all this gentrification stuff yeah, it's, it's, that's going on, that's displacing. That's like manifest destiny all over again. Yeah, with a nice, pretty smile on it. Like One of the things that's so interesting is that you don't have to be mean about it anymore. The mean people built the machine. Right. You don't have to have a right. vicious place in your heart for people of color because all white people know that if I don't hustle, I could end up homeless too. So why wouldn't they take any advantage given to them? It's just human nature. They've been diametrically set up systemically against the best interest of people of color. They were born into that machine. You know what I'm saying? So they don't understand what's going on. And for real, for real, business is a predatory game in the first place. So when they run up against stuff like, what you mean cultural preservation? I'm just trying to get this money. It wasn't the problem when I acquired this other business. Why am I going to run up against this? Stuff? Because they don't even be trained to think like that. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's a right. whole different ball game. 
That it, and it's a whole other level of education that I sometimes think has systemically been denied purposely from the American kids. Absolutely. Of course. I, I mean, you're not going to get any. I feel mm. like we're all going to be like, yeah. mm, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, we can think back, especially now when I think back just about the education that I got. And I had a yeah. decent education, you yeah. know. That's why my parents, they left Brooklyn. They moved to Westchester so we could, like, yeah. go to good schools mm. and da-da-da-da-da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... And I and I just think about how they, you know, the portrayed, um, you know, like Booker T versus W. E. B. Du, du Bois, Bois yeah. right? Yeah. And just but and then what I know of that, right, is they made it seem like they were like, well, well, Booker T thought, you know, that they shouldn't do too much, or you know what I mean? Like it was like, right. and they, they that's how they taught it to us. You went to like the same school. You're mm. from New York, yeah. You know, and I feel like that's how that's it was. what they did with King and Malcolm. Too, yeah, was, it was it was set up as this dichotomy. Um, yeah, they, yeah. It, there's always a narrative. There's yeah. a story. And yeah. The story is that you know Malcolm was an extremist and King was nice and easy to get along with, and that's yeah. the that's the story. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The way I grew up in on the on the East Coast is that it it's very similar, New York, Maryland, um, very similar to what you're talking about. And so what my black community did was, even though we learned that crazy stuff in school that was mm -hmm. not inclusive, in the community, we got other stuff. We, we learned other we, we learned other stuff. Yeah. And it was and and it was ongoing. And even with the autobiography of Malcolm X, I grew up with George Haley, yeah. who is the brother of Alex Haley, Alex Haley who wrote the book. And so I grew up with George Haley <clears throat> and we were doing stuff all the time. He's one of my elders. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I grew up with his children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we were always getting additional information, such that when Alex Haley Haley wrote Roots. He came to our community and talked to us about the history yeah. of that. So we had additional yes. yeah. edu ed ed education. We had to supplement. We had to take control of our own yeah. Yeah. Uh, education as a supplement to what we were getting formally. And I think that's the kind of thing we're going to have to start doing in Denver. Yeah, yeah. Now, Dr. Diggs, you work for the schools. And I know I anything you say has nothing to reflect upon Denver Public Schools. Mm -hmm. But I do want to ask about, because, you know, my son is little, but he's going to starting into the public school system in a couple years. And do you think now the curriculum is any better? Do you the curriculum any? is not better. Um, there are, so, so for example, I'm just going to tell no, you, I'm, I'm, the I first like time African Americans see themselves in the curriculum, mm -hmm. they see themselves as slaves. Yeah. Okay. And we can make parallel observations about Latinos and we can make parallel observations about Native Americans. Uh, we can probably, I, I haven't studied this part, but even Asian Americans. And mm -hmm. so it's not better. Okay. Um, and so we, what I will say is, uh, there is attention being paid to it uh, because we do have some educators of color. We do have new initiatives about culturally responsive education. Um, so we have a lot of talk around it. Uh, we do not yet have a lot of substance mm -hmm. and curriculum mm -hmm. around it. But what I will say for DPS is if you look at school districts across the nation, you don't have a lot of school districts even talking right. a, a, about it. But I'm going to tell you from my perspective, I may get in trouble for this um, uh, because this is my new lens based on our new environment. Um, talk is no longer enough. Talk is no Thank longer you. enough. There needs to be some substance put behind it, and we need to be pushing our actual official education system to do much, much better. And at the same time, though, we can't wait. We can't wait for the system. We can't put our trust in the system. We have to start telling our kids about what's going on. Matter of fact, I was talking to one of these African-American principals, and here's what he has done. And I think it's pretty radical. Two years ago, um, he exposed his students to the new Jim Crow. Mm. He didn't give them the book, but he did the TED Talk mm -hmm. in an assembly, mm -hmm. all school assembly. Mm. He said the kids were upset and it blew their minds. They didn't know. 
And they were pacing mad. They're like, we're not, it's not going down like this. That was two years ago. The next year, he followed up with 13. Mm. Called all the students together. Black school, black and Latino school. Black and Latino school. Called all the kids together. They watched 13, and they talked about it. These kids are like, whoa, we didn't know. Only way I found out about it was I happened to, the Colorado uh, Black, uh, with a CP. Yeah, Colorado Black Roundtable. Uh, no, not the Roundtable, but yeah. the Black Women for Political Action. Mm. Yeah. They approached me and said, you know what? We want to show um, I'm not your Negro. Mm, yeah. You know, and you work with the schools, you want to do it at a school. And I picked the school that I knew where stuff was going on. And we did that program with kids. And the kids were like, you know what? We actually learn about this, but there's nothing like seeing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Seeing it. And then they talked about it. And when they talked about it, their teachers talked about it with yeah. them. And then their parents who were in the room talked about it with them because our parents. We don't talk about the old mm-hmm. school struggle mm-hmm. with our kids anymore. That's but that's the revolution. Mm. Well, yeah, that's I mean, the revolution. I mean, you you got to keep in mind, you know what I'm saying? Um, that was one of the things that I think that the trauma of the civil rights era did to black parents. When, they, when, when things started getting better in the 80s and stuff, they were like, let's mm-hmm. just not talk about it. Just mm-hmm. please enjoy this American mm-hmm. dream we done got mm-hmm. for you. Mm-hmm. Whereas Jewish people be like, never forget. Mm. Jewish people be like, we going to get you inculcated in knowing what your struggle was. Mm-hmm. First it was Egypt, and then it was like the fast and the Passover and stuff. And then there was Holocaust, and you going to learn about this Holocaust today. And we ain't never going to forget, and you going to get a trip to Europe, and you going to get a bar mitzvah. You going to learn Hebrew, you know what I'm saying? So there's a whole willful inculcation they work through the trauma. They work and they 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 hold on to it. Be like, this is what you must. Make. We're fighting our whole thing is to make sure that this stuff don't ever happen again. Right. You know what I'm saying? Well, black folks, we were so close to the fire. Still, it was like, all right, look, just in, in, enjoy your life. You know what I mean? And what that did was to set up a dynamic whereby we had a whole generation of forgetting because the parents didn't teach mm. in mass. Mm. And I can remember in the '90s. All this stuff that we call woke right now, mm. pro-black, and you know what I'm saying, Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. When people was talking about that stuff in the 90s, they was looked like like fossils. They was looked at like, what you, what you think this is? You all want to be Huey P. Newton looking? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you all Angela Davis yeah, yeah, You all where, where, where your apple pick and your dashiki. You, all you need is dashiki, brother. And there was some substance to that because the, the 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 crime rate was mad real in the '90s. Like it ain't like what it is. Like not even Chirac is like what it used to be right. in, in in the '90s. Yeah. So you know, even Pac said, and they say it's the white man I should fear, but it's my own kind doing all the killing here. Mm. So even Pac said that, right? So that we were in a land of sleep. Mm. And I remember when I was in college. Uh, George W. Bush had waged a war on terror. So me and my boys waged a war on ignorance. Mm. But we was putting up flyers, having you know forums and stuff. And I'm telling you, at a black school, nobody was trying to hear it, bro. Mm-hmm. Wow. We were, it was like a full on people was sleep. So now when this has come back around again, I just hope that we capture this moment and see the cyclical nature of this oppression so we don't fall asleep again. Because if we do, we could lose another generation again. Mm-hmm. And that's what's at stake to me, you know. So that's why I'm trying to get my word out there and teach as much as I can, you know. That's excellent, mm-hmm. man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what we need to do. That's yeah. what we need to every, do. Every avenue I get, I try to open up a forum where we can have these discussions, you know. Yeah. Something that came up um, for me, I was, on, I was on the old Facebook, as I often am. Mm-hmm. And it was like the New York Times does their race talk. Have you seen any of those? And they do like a live thing and they have some people and they have a couple academics Mm -hmm. and they were talking about this term diversity fatigue Mm -hmm. have you heard this well i have heard it yes okay don't break it down so they're talking about diversity fatigue (laughs) as in people are not wanting to have diversity like for the sake of diversity and they're just like oh why do i have to hire xyz or why do we have to talk about this or why are we talking about black people's rights or black people's experience or this and that that was like my understanding of it that that i think that's a good understanding and succinctly it's people are tired (laughs) 
of yeah. talking about diversity. And I was sitting there watching it, and I, I my eyes were like, like I felt my head was gonna explode. I was so mad. I'm like, diversity fatigue. I'm like, this is just a word for racism. Like, what are you talking about? But is this this idea that we have to like make a case for diversity? I've been wanting to tell the people, oh, you tired. <laughs> oh, you upset now. If you tired. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, like, I was hanging out with a member of the Little Rock Nine. All right. Mm-hmm. Right. I, okay. I, I follow you. So, I, yeah. Yeah. So, Carlotta Walls and Nier and I did an interview for NPR. And white folks at that time were so racist that you needed to escort black children to school with the mm-hmm. National Guard. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm sure Collada Walls and Near had getting spat on fatigue. Mm. I'm sure she had getting punched in the back fatigue. Mm. I'm sure she had getting tired of called an N word fatigue. Well, I'm sure she was very tired. You know what I'm saying? So you don't want to talk about the only thing, and really, diversity is a really penny ante attempt at reparations. Mm. Oh, it, snap. <laughs> It really is like a freaking <laughs> half-assed diet brand version of what's for real, for real old. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like now you're upset because you're just having to consider other people's lives. Right. Mm. How sad for you. Right. You know what I'm saying? But in the meantime, I, I just think it's so interesting. Like the white race... If there is such a thing. There's Those, not. Everybody yeah, knows yeah, that. Yeah, but, <laughs> but let's say that for the sake of America, we got to mark this shit on our, um, you know, our, right. our right. census forms. The, 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 the folks classified as white had the military power to quarantine the resources of this nation. It was a full on war. Mm-hmm. It was a brutal thing to create all of this separation to begin with. I often say that America is like Rome pretending to be Greece. Ooh. Mm. Because it wants to be known as a democratic state, but in the meantime, you're chopping people up. Mm. Yeah. Now, at least have the gumption that Rome had. Rome didn't hide nobodies. Rome would exaggerate. We killed more people than we did. Like, like Rome <laughs> went in. Mm. You know what I'm saying? They owned their dirt. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you have this split, a schism in the psyche of America we brown folks are the telltale heart. Mm. We are the walking corpses. We are the ghosts of empire saying, hey, knocking on your door, remember what you promised me in this democratic document called the Constitution? That's yeah. right. You see what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Mm-hmm. And so they don't want to be reminded of that. And as tired as they think they are, I think we're more tired of not having what we're supposed to have to survive. Like, this, like there is a huge swath of the black community now that also has diversity fatigue, but in another direction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Speak on it. Mm. Speak on it. Because we like, we tired of getting denied diversity and we're fatigued. Like we're tired of having to always toe the line of I believe in America. Like black folks, especially this young generation, if you talk to anybody who was out there in Ferguson, mm. if you talk to anybody They're who's not been out here fighting this fight, it's like... Am I going to have to tell my kids what I did in another generation? Mm-hmm. Am I going to have to, you know what I'm saying? Am I about to be the elder in another wave of uh, European peoples who fall asleep again? Yeah. So they got like, there was this hashtag that went around right before Trump got elected called Blacksit. It was like, <laughs> it was like That's Brexit. Not... But <laughs> like that. Black folks, we out. We taking all the shea butter. <laughs> We taking, all, <laughs> we taking all the pink oil. We taking all of it. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 what it was was like uh, on the internet, we began to assess our cultural capital and see what we have contributed mm. and how it would be better served in our own hands rather than America's hands. Mm. Because when you're trying to get diverse, like flat out, I was in an interview with Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck, he's like, he tell me, on the day that Obama got elected, I felt like a lot of people's like, ha ha, the tables have turned. And there was some kind of uh, air that now you're going to get what's coming to you. And I told Glenn Beck, I was like, to the contrary, sir. The day that Obama got elected, you've seen Negroes more patriotic than we ever been. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. We were so we was like, mm-hmm. you know what? Maybe this could work. Yeah. Maybe this could happen. I feel like right. I'm you know what I'm saying? Like if you remember where you was in November uh, 2008 oh, I when that man got elected, I do. I do. Your heart was like, like, like you saw. I mean, the wokest of the woke was like, you know what? We gonna get this a because shot. I'm gonna tell you. So I'm old. So I'm old. I'm gonna I'm invoke my age here. All right, all right. I'm gonna invoke mm-hmm. my age here. All right. I'm old, mm-hmm. and my parents. You know, we were my parents and my grandparents used to talk about you can be whatever you wanted to be, but that did not include being president of the United States. Mm. If you talk about, oh, I wanted to be president, people were like, shh, oh, mm. no. And I'm telling you, mm. yeah. I'm telling you, it impressed me, mm-hmm. and I'm the oldest one in this room, mm. but those who are older than me, they never, they had dreams, yeah. mm-hmm. but they never... So my yeah. dad is dream about my that. dad is eight like about eighty five years old. And mm. I remember in the primary in New York mm. and I was like, Well, who are you gonna vote for? You know, like in the primary and my dad was like Oh, Hillary, he's like, I'm never not ready for no black president. You know, and it was like and I just I always remember that and we were all completely like blown out of the water. We were so, you know, and then also, you know, being my half black, half white self, it was a coup for us as well. You know, mm. and it was like it was just he couldn't he couldn't believe it. Either. Yeah, nobody you know? could. It was it was amazing, it was and I do dream. remember that moment. I'm sitting there, I'm watching, I'm I'm just bawling, I'm crying, and yeah. I was with all white people, and none of them were crying. I'll tell you that, okay? Yeah. They were not crying. Yeah, Only because I was crying. Be, be, because it was it, it's a different emotional catharsis for us. And when I sat there, and I said, there's two incidents that made black folks start to lose hope even after Obama got elected. First one was the Tea Party movement, mm-hmm. yeah. when we saw how he was treated, yeah. caricaturized, yeah. and yeah. made into a monkey and a joker and all that. Yeah. And the second one was the advent of Trayvon and what happened when Obama said Trayvon could have been my son mm. and how everybody had a hissy fit. That right there made me see the outrage of the oppressor is seldomly a compass to truth mm. because it's just not. You know, you're outraged again, Fox News. Okay. Like, that's almost like a dog barking to me. I can tune that out. That don't mean (laughs) nothing to me. You know what I'm saying? There's no truth in that. But we began to see, oh, man, we could actually get the American dream and still be denied. Watching him get discriminated against and obstructionist Republican politics Mm -hmm. all over again. Mm -hmm. It's like like vicariously, we was getting oppressed through Obama, looking at him every single day. Right. People, folks wish they could have called him the N-word. That's right. You know what I'm saying? And so I was like, you know what? And he was called a monkey. Un-American. As soon as as Obama opened his Twitter account, it was near. You know, so we have we're really questioning whether the path to freedom is into America now. A lot of us is thinking it might be a way, and I don't I don't I don't blame you. Well, because we, we have been happening. we've been living for generations under the myth yeah, of inclusion and the myth of e- equality. And I'm getting ready to say something that I've said before, but I'm gonna credit my cousin Tracy L. Scott for, hey, Tracy. for, for saying this. <laughs> she says to me, um, you cannot behave your way out of the color of your skin. That's so real, bro. You know? That is absolutely It doesn't true. matter what your education is. <laughs> it doesn't matter how you speak. It doesn't matter how you are dressed. You are still black. That's what Jay-Z or, said. <laughs> or you are still Latino. Or you are still Native American. Or you are still Asian. Yeah, yeah. And and it and and that's a reality that people of color and difference live with. It, 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 it's such a reality that it, it begins to make you think. You know what I'm saying? Because you know now that I you know got a lady in my life that I'm thinking about you know that good stuff, and I'm and, and, and I'm thinking to myself, what do I got to do to make sure that my son and daughter don't uh, go through this? Right. And I think that it's that's that's part of why I went undercover. How deep is this hatred really? It's deep. How is how how far does it go? And what I found was beneath the hatred was fear. Mm. A deep fear, bro. And that fear was based on the zero-sum game that race has been set up as. 
there's a winner and there's a loser. That's right. And mm-hmm. any ga- any ground you gain any is, is a loss for them and vice versa. You know what I'm saying? And so it's been set up as there's only finite resources. Claude Anderson classifies race as a group competition for Earth's resources. He said racism is a group sport. Hmm. And and European peoples, when they fought amongst each other and then expanded out to the world, they was like, damn, we got more in common with each other than we do with some of these folks we see in India, Asia, and Africa, and the New World. Because, yeah. listen, yeah. Uh, 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 Italian and Irish folks in America wasn't, wasn't weren't white. even white. They there was white not ever. a lot of talk of white people. Until relatively right. recently, yeah. historically. Historically. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, European people didn't see each other as a big happy family. Right. I mean, no. like... That's why we're here. That's yeah. why they're here. Yeah, straight up. <laughs> I mean, l- l- listen, yo. The entire history of the Middle East that people say they've been fighting since been fighting, since been bi- biblical times, is really the history of Europe. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you really look at it. In fact, there has been no Arab... African or Asian conflict that threatened to destroy the world. Whoa. Only two European conflicts mm-hmm. threatened to destroy the world. That's how bad they've been fighting. And the only thing that brought peace to Europe was a thermonuclear warhead. Mm. Only when total destruction was guaranteed for both parties did folks start negotiating. That's right. within my daddy's lifetime. And he alive and kicking. So this means to me... That this is something that, like, we as people of color took personally. I seen the movie Braveheart. Mm. For one of the first scenes in the Braveheart, he walk into the shed, and all them people is lynched, hung from the ceiling. And I said, oh, black folks took this personally. <laughs> this been happening right. since it's been happening. All it needed was a dividing line. If it wasn't black versus white, it was Catholic versus Protestant. Well, you, 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 you name it, you know what I'm saying? Scottish right. versus English, you know what I'm saying? Um... Roman versus Gaul or Hun. It was always there. Business as usual. Business mm. as usual. So it's just like we're, we're, we're trying to figure out how to survive this and come out still with a piece of our real soul intact. Right. Trying not to become evil by fighting evil is one of the hardest tasks that any freedom fighter has to deal with. All right. You know but I, mean? I still think, though, what it come, when you say that, like, it's like, oh, when pe- when Obama got elected or, um, and you know what I'm saying, Glenn Beck was like, oh, I thought this was going to happen. Now, oh, yeah, it's, it's our so turn, right? Right. <laughs> right? But I think that that's the thing is, like, they think, and I'm using they, no offense, white James, we love you, <laughs> but it's just that they think that we're going to, like, turn around and do the same thing to them. That's and I feel the pro- like that's not and, what and we're And psychologically, we call that projection. We call, sure. that, projection. We call that projection. Straight. That's what James Baldwin was all about. Yeah. James Baldwin laid that mm-hmm. out so clear in I Am Not Your Negro. Yeah. He was like, why do you need a nigger? Yeah. Why do you need that? What is it about your societal setup? It's like a Christmas play, and there's always the role of Judas. Well, in the play of America, there's always the role of nigger. Why do you need that? You know what I'm saying? That's the biggest question, and it's like, when we didn't fit it as good, well, they tried the Mexicans for a while. Mm -hmm. Now they put the Arabs in that seat. You know what I'm saying? But nobody fit quite like the original person in the part, you know? And Mm. so, it's like... (laughs) Damn. (laughs) (laughs) Like, it's just one of them situations where... Like, I want to write a new play. I think that's why black folks is wigging on this Black Panther about to come out. Mm. I think, I, oh <laughs> man, we need to do it. Listen, listen, now that you got, we definitely need to do a Black Panther. Yeah, I we're going to have to talk about I, Black Panther because this is like, this is, I ain't seen black folks this excited since Obama got elected. Okay, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> true when you see that movie poster you're like oh my goodness like it's so like Chadwick Boseman beautiful is God right now, it's though. like all black everything now it's like all that's black what i did everything. want to talk about though because right. i did hear this you know oh, yeah. stirrings about michael b jordan having ah. wait but wait can i just tell you what happened though okay, so i saw it. it i saw it like you know i'm on the twitters mm-hmm. and <laughs> i was i was uh, looking twitters. at it the twitters <laughs> i'm old too and uh and i saw it and they were like Oh, everyone's mad now. Black women are gonna boycott Black Panther because Michael B. Jordan has a white girlfriend. And I was like, you know, boycotting Black Panther because of that. Nobody boycotting Black Panther because of that. So I laughed, and then I kind of like I thought about it, and I like wrote it down. I was like, oh, maybe we talk about it off color. It'll be funny, Mm. whatever, right? So then, (laughs) then I like looked it up. 
picture of her. And that girl is Latina. Her name is like Ashlyn Castro and she is mm-hmm. hot. She is and cute. she's just, but I was like, every, do you know what I, yeah, like it just, hot to death, yo. it just made me laugh oh, though because yeah. I was like, and, and it was Aww. all fake because black women were not tripping they, on that. They, no one black cares. women want to see Michael B. B. Jordan with his shirt off. See, that's right. See, they don't the want to turn it off. None of that. Them sisters people. going for Michael. <laughs> okay. I was like, oh, Michael B. Jordan, I guess, you know, I guess you're not going to go out with me now. But, you know, you got your... <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I know I'm married, okay? But no, just because right. 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 I'm married doesn't mean I can't look at Michael B. Jordan with the feelings in my heart. I'm still holding out for Angela <laughs> Bassett. She married. I know. I, like, cause, uh, I was like, because Angela Bassett, I was like, so she's married to a black man. Does that not factor? See, in, 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 you know what I'm saying? Like, Michael, you know, like, you know, she married to Cordy B. Vance. So, anyway. You know, it's <laughs> it's just one of them things. I, I I think somebody started that to just drum up. They something. did. Yeah. 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 It was a hoax. Yeah. I don't think this going to qualify yeah. as yeah. fake news. It right? was yeah. fake. Yeah. It, was, it was fake because even you Black Twitter. Here, so so Black Twitter. So, so let me just tell you, but Black Twitter, <laughs> you on the Twitters, Black Twitter shut that shit down. <laughs> they're like, they're I don't like, know what the fuck you talking about. They're like, stop you know. trying to say our Black Girl Magic is going right. to be boycotting Black Panther. It was it was just a funny Y'all thing ain't working thing to on me. I'm sorry. You're yeah, going to see yeah. right. people are going to see Black Panther dressed like Prince Hakeem from see? Coming to America. See? <laughs> y'all, y'all gonna be right there with your dashikis on. Uh, that, it's gonna be. Good. I might like, get a dashiki just to special go. for the occasion. I don't. I already have one. Because I, 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 no <laughs> I mean, realistically, there are some brothers that's married to sisters. That I would trade in a heartbeat <laughs> for some white folk. <laughs> Stop you understand it. what I'm saying? Yeah. Ben Carson got a black wife. Have Does you heard her me- sing? I, I don't want to. I'm trying to race that myth. <laughs> <You memory. heard laughs> I thought it was a joke. I was like, what's going on? No, no. No. So, 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 so Ben Carson has a black wife. So he's doing more for the cause <laughs> than Van Jones, who has a white wife. Yeah. So, you see what I'm saying? Right. All right, so. Uh, what you're saying is that Nate Parker made the Nat Turner movie, right? He's got a white wife. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he's not doing as much for the cause as Bill Cosby, who has a black wife. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. You got Jordan Peele, who made Get Out, mm. hit black folks so hard, y'all forgot about that shit. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. He got a white wife, so come on now. And it, and it, goes, and it goes way yeah, back. Yeah, I mean, on. I think Frederick yeah. Douglass had a white wife. He sure did. Now, that you know, is his second wife. Yeah. His you know, so, black, so you know. Died. When we talk about interracial, obviously that is like <laughs> my yeah. wheelhouse. Yeah. But for me, it's like it's impossible for me basically to date within my race, quote unquote. When, for you, right? right, right for me, right. that's how it is. But I did marry a mixed race person as well. And yeah. that was not something that was like intentional. That's just how yeah. my life kind of mm-hmm. played out. But there is something about him that's really beautiful to me, to me that I can see in him. You so, know that I see those the same things that I have. Or so something. one of that, when, and I think that's it. What you just said is it, and I think both of you said that is when you have a shared cultural frame of reference, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know each other in a certain way. Yeah. You know that mm-hmm. makes it comfortable, and and if your your circles <laughs> share that. You, you know, yeah. you have that, you have that share. It's like, you know, the whole reason why people stand up for you at your wedding, mm-hmm. that's symbolic of that yeah. custom yeah. of your circle, yeah. you know, yeah. of your circle. It's like, these are my people. These are our, my people and your people are now our people. Mm-hmm. And we stand with each other in support yeah. of, of, of this relationship. That's what the... Custom and the tradition it, it, it is, yeah. is, is is about, yeah. and when we lose sight of that, we got all kinds of drama. Yeah, yeah we got yeah. all kinds of drama. We do. I mean, because the bottom line is that this was all a construct to begin with. It's just about what's just gonna happen first. Is a raceless world gonna happen first, or is a world where us having to survive due to somebody making race a thing for us gonna happen first? Mm. That's what I'm trying to figure out right now. I'm trying to read the winds on this. Because there is another solution. There is a possibility that a non-zero-sum game, when it comes to the resources of the planet, could be engineered. It's like, I don't know if I can even get black folks to work through the pain that they justifiably feel. 
to see if we can engineer a resource system where race don't have to be a thing no more. I think it's possible and we might be in it because, um, like you said, I don't. I don't want to. I, I don't want to use the term blessing, and I refuse to do that. But I think uh, one possibility of uh, the backlash against our current climate mm-hmm. um, is that maybe, maybe in the next year or so, some of the oppressed white folks mm. will start to wake up because you know, listen, Trump done sold them all. Oh, they, but they out. can't even. They don't even know. I know. I know. So so. But I'm just saying there may be a possibility. They, know, but they are willfully. I want white it. perspective, James. Uh oh. Damn. No. Because you, no. you represent all the white people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all white people now. I actually agree with with what Theo was was in the middle of saying. I don't. I don't buy that. Poor white people have been suffering for a very long time. That's not a new thing. Poor people have been suffering in America forever. No. Um, but the, the, the purpose of a culture built around white supremacy is to convince people that That's no right. matter how bad their lot is, at least they're white. James is, is right. That is key to how. Yeah. But we sometimes rationalize that as that those are the skinheads and the white supremacists. But actually, it's the regular white folks. It'd be, it, it, and, and it'd be it's like the a, nice, dude. it's the nice white folks. It, and I mean, there are. I, I will say that there are white folks who I know whose whose heart breaks open when they see. I that. know, I know. The, 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 I, I, you know, just I have to assess all of reality. There are white folks whose heart breaks open when they see that. Shit. Mm. But then there's, but then here's the problem. It's like a horror movie. You don't know who's who. I remember the mm. day. I remember the day that like 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 wow. Trump got elected. I'm in my job like, which one of y'all betrayed me? <laughs> wow. Which, one of, the, which yes. one of y'all threw the bus on wow. my back? Yes. You know what I'm saying? And wow. it's just this horror movie where it's like you don't know who's the sleeper agent. You don't know who's got this mind virus. Wow. Called white supremacy, and you don't know what they're gonna do. It's like the Matrix. It's like any moment y'all could just turn into Agent Smith and put a gun to everybody here. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, okay, yeah. there is like legitimate survival concerns that are being framed as black wow. extremism. That's right. We're facing yeah. some extreme shit and are having extreme reactions to some extreme shit. And so when I went undercover, I found, I found the philosopher's stone of this thing. I found the Arkenstone, the jewel, the crux of all of this. And what this is, is that, and this is kind of inexplicable, yo, this is a deep truth here, is that across the globe, European peoples have a negative birth rate, and it doesn't matter what country they're in. It literally doesn't matter. From America to Canada, the entire European Union, down to Australia, New Zealand, all of the, quote, white man's lands have white folks not breeding Right. At a replacement rate. Right. And here's how the numbers break down. A woman must have 2.1 children in order to have a replacement birth rate. That's just across humanity. Hmm. If your numbers slip to 1.9, you can recover, but it takes 80 years. Dang. The replacement rates across the white world right now are roughly... 1.4 to 1.6, wow. 1.7. We're looking at unrecoverable European birth rates across the globe, all at the same goddamn time. And I was like, well, who has the highest birth rates on the planet? I said, it's got to be Latin America. Shit, the way it's looking, it's Latin America. <laughs> and it ain't. It's Sub Saharan Africa. Mm. Sub Saharan right. Africa. And I haven't been able to substantiate this report. But they said something like there were more babies born in Nigeria last year than white babies in the entire European Union. That's mm. just Nigeria. Mm. And so what it is is this fear of a genetic annihilation. Absolutely. And that's what's been the, the crux of it. So there's this thing where like they're holding on to the phenotype, the European expression of genes which are all linked to recessive genes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, black folks didn't set that shit up. You fam, you. So yeah. ISIS, I'm, I'm, I'm. That uh, sounds like I'm Francis the, uh, Press. Right, I'm ISIS, ISIS papers, papers on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was the, that was the first book I, I, I read it, fam, you. 
And here's what I said. Uh, I had a chance to speak to Jared Taylor. Mm-hmm. He's like the Sith Lord of white supremacy. Mm. Y'all looking at Darth Vader. That's Steve Bannon. I'm looking at the Sith Lord, mm. Jared Taylor. Because his research is the ideological basis for all the Breitbart's racism that Steve Bannon then publishes. So I spoke to Jared Taylor and he said, well, of course I'm invested in the survival of white genetics. And I said, well, white genetics will never be annihilated. You put them in everybody. Mm -hmm. His genetic survival is assured as long as there are human beings. His his genes will survive. But he was like, no, that's not good enough. And I was like, you're attached to a phenotype. And I said, if the Africans that first migrated to Europe were attached to their phenotype, there wouldn't be any white people. Like, when you look at the fact that the borders of whiteness have been expanded several times to increase their numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, borders yeah. of whiteness didn't include <laughs> Irish people who look white to me. Like, why, why, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, the borders of whiteness didn't include Jews. Uh, no. didn't, didn't include Italians. Italians. No. You know what I'm saying? So... So this, so these are these are categories that are man-made, yes. right? And they're 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 man-made by those who have the power. But you know I will say this: this is an. <laughs> <laughs> it was from my favorite thing that ever happened with that lady. Lady, I don't know where you are, and I want to give you full credit for this because I like to use this line all the time. But social construct is as real as a baseball bat, so it doesn't. Yeah. So it even though matter. it's constructed, it doesn't matter that it's constructed. It's usually in a way. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's, it's still, still a, it's still a tool. Yeah. Right. And so, all right, that's what's up. But then, like at the end, what are you willing to do to enforce it? Ooh. What are you mm. willing to do? And I told this to Jerry Taylor too. I was like, if you add up what y'all are talking about, they have a concept called race realism. Race is absolutely real. You know what I mean? You see it. And I'm like, all right, well, to a certain level, yeah. People from West Africa tend to be pretty fucking fast at the Olympics. Okay. I got it. All right? It's, it's, it's true. It's There's true. no affirmative action are, at the Olympics. But, all right? All right. But what does that really even mean? Right. Is it worth killing people? Like, is it worth making people suffer to the level? The consequences, there are differences. But the consequences we've attached to the differences are just unnatural, right? Mm. They're just unnatural. They're unnecessarily high. You don't, it, 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 it doesn't have to be this way. You know what I'm saying? I got more difference between me and my mama's skin tone, who was a black woman, you know what I'm saying? Than maybe your skin tone and somebody who would be a white person, right. you know what I mean? So right. what are these degrees? But what we are, are we gonna, and, and- And the unfortunate thing is, as you asked the question, mm-hmm. the unfortunate thing is that history has some answers. History does have some mm. answers. Mm. So Jim. I want to unpack this more okay. because this is something, although I have had a lot of wine, okay. but but I feel like, okay, what am I trying to get at here? Can we take a break? Sure. You guys, we're going to take a little break. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. Quite a lynch mob, mm-hmm. right? Actually can be culture, freaking language police in a certain way that it's like I know what they're trying to get at, but how they do it uh, actually exacerbates the problem, right? And that is one of the things that I found when uh, I was doing undercover work. They were saying that you know you're trying to culture police my language, and honestly, I think that. You know, my, my, my retort to that is, well, you know, it's the first time in 500 years white folks have had to watch their mouths, but what do we mm. know? Mm. Emmett, Emmett Till didn't get a chance to watch his mouth, did he? Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, but in that, I get where it's like, okay, but if you have no context, if you don't realize that you're dealing with people who have been victimized by having been robbed of the context of their outrage, well, then you're just going to make it worse. Right. You know so saying? and so when you say that though, for right. me right now, I've been having mm-hmm. I've been having a hard time with that because yeah, I I, I feel like I'm mixed. I'm like people think I'm Puerto Rican, whatever they think mm-hmm. I am. But then I come in and I'm like talking about whatever I'm talking about, and it's 
it's like they get so upset when yeah. I call them out on things or yeah. they're like not expecting it or they oh, yeah. don't think that this is going to happen, and, right? And, and, and I'm going to do it, you know? And let me be fair. A lot of this is how I deal with kids. Hmm. I didn't say that. When I deal with youth, when I speak at colleges, when I'm dealing with folks who are in their younger years, if you're older and white, you actually should know a lot better than these kids. So let me just say that. So when you're dealing with folks, I actually understand your heavier hand. I get that, actually. This is the internet age, homie. You can Google shit. You right. can figure out what the hell is what, you know, with yeah. this context. So a lot of ignorance is ignorance. Mm. You're Ooh. ignoring things because the you don't know. The wordsmith up in here. You know what I'm saying? But it's, it, 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 it's actually super real, yo. Like, white folks got damaged by slavery, too. Right. Mm. And that's not often talked about. We're now beginning to unpack that black folks, of course, have these historical traumas picked up by environmental learning because we was just trying to teach our kids to survive. Mm -hmm. And that meant that we had certain biases against even ourselves that Mm -hmm. were passed down. But some happened to white folks, too. And this is evident. If you witness one murder, you could be in therapy for life. Right. White folks were witnessing murders. And they were just walking around with that inside of them. You know, if you got a child who was in the front of a lynch mob and seen a black man get hung, burned, and his testicles cut off, the only thing that's going to keep little Billy from going crazy is when his entire community affirms that he just witnessed something awesome and not awful. You see what I mean? That is a thing. And so there's the pain of the guilt that white folks have been carrying around. That's a pain spirit. Mm. That's a trauma. Mm. You see what I'm saying? And we live in denial. And and, and that that breeds denial, defensiveness. That breeds all of that. You know what I'm saying? So it's dysfunctional. It is fully dysfunctional, brother. And of course, it perpetuates... Mm. The denialism entraps them back into the cycle of being oppressors to begin with, which is really, really cold blooded. Wow, it's that's a messed wow. up cycle, yo. But and then how are we gonna break it? And that's one of the things that came <clears throat> out of that gross diversity fatigue thing I heard. <clears throat> but it was that one of the questions though was that we we're having these conversations, right? We're sitting here, we're having it. You're leading conversations. You're leading conversations. I hope to God White James is leading conversations. So, so, but, I'll be like, <laughs> why you got White James? Have you noticed saying. every guest is really uncomfortable with White James? And that's, what, <laughs> that's, that, that's been a universal. So response. maybe, yeah, but yeah, we need to huddle up on that. I will but, uh, not huddle. I'm just like, don't cut off, James. Oh, James. <laughs> See, James. I know. No, no, no. But that was, we were just thinking of like nicknames. Well, that's a thing. We We talk about that. We, we. (laughs) What you mean we? (laughs) All right. Okay. Let's be real now. White James, does it bother you when I call you white James? No, I'm fine with white James. It's just a joke because you're white. I am. But it's a thing. It's that's, for another, that's for another. That's for another. That's for another day. It? Langston yeah. was more upset by it. Langston didn't like white <laughs> See? James. See, I mean, look. Langston. So Langston is my son. I'm gonna call you James because I don't know you like that. That's shit. all right. That's all right. You feel me? Right. I just I just know this dude today, so I'm sure. gonna call him James because it's like man to man. I don't know him like that. Right. Okay. You know I would like to formally. Oh, it's all good. No, no. Oh, God. He gonna get rid of me. I'm not we, we, I never fucking apologize. Now there's gonna be all no. comments. I can't, <laughs> believe you, I can't believe you made Rebecca apologize. Yeah. Why would you make me apologize for a job? Jolly... I made her apologize. And I'm the darkest person in the room, so that's what go. it is. There you go. <laughs> you're, pretty, you're, pretty, you're pretty, pretty black. But, but I, so let me ask and get Wait, serious sorry. and bring it around to what you're saying, because mm. I think what you're saying mm. is the diversity fatigue that you're talking about in a way i think that that defensiveness and that denial is a response to what theo is talking about which is sort of the james baldwin thing that like an oppressor debases himself at the same moment that he's Mm -hmm. debasing Mm -hmm. the other person is it this feeling that the culture told us that diversity was sufficient that having a United Colors of Benetton situation where as long as there's as long as there's faces represented, that's sufficient. And the discovery that diversity is not the same thing as equality mm. is sort of freaking people out. And they don't they they feel that they've done work that they haven't done. And they feel that yeah. they're not getting credit for the work that they think they've done. 
And that's some real shit. I, I feel like this. I've been recently unpacking male privilege. Mm. Something that me as a man, I didn't think that I had. Mm. So I be trying to do stuff to be like, yo, I'm trying to address my male privilege. And then the sis be like, that ain't enough, bro. I'm like, well, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I just tried to goddamn, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so now, like, right, yeah, like, y'all just... know, like, 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 can I acknowledge how far I done come? I grew up on Snoop. I don't call women the B word no more like that. I don't be like, you know what I'm saying? But that ain't enough. No, it's right. not. So, you know what I'm saying? It just be like, I did something, but that ain't enough. Yeah. I feel like there may be certain things that conversations can't solve. Like, because, and like, nothing got me more acquainted with the powerlessness of words than me being good at them. Ooh. You know what I'm whoa. saying? Mm. Because as a spoken word poet, I've crafted some incredible ass words. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm just going to pat myself on the back right there. And I know what words can't do because I got very proficient at them. And so now I have this metaphor because my homeboy dropped this on me and I was like, shit. So I'm going to just look like this, right? Let's say I'm an abusive ass dude, right? To my girl or whatever. Let's say just any of these guys. Just picture a guy. Mm -hmm. A Ike Turner situation. Mm -hmm. Abusive as hell to his girl. Beats her down and whatnot. You know, all the abuse, the rape. Imagine it. Then they go to marriage counseling, right? And they say, we got to get a divorce and shit. After the divorce, can they still be roommates? Because that's what integration is. Oh, damn. You know what I'm saying? I did not know you were going there. And that's, yeah. that's deep. <laughs> because it's like, even if, I, even if my girl has swore, I will never wake up in the middle of the night and cut your throat. <laughs> I will never wake up in the middle of the night and hit you with some fried, you know, some, some hot grease. You know what I'm saying? I'm still sleeping with one eye open. And everything, every move that she make that look like self-respect, every move that she make that look mm -hmm. like reclamation, triggers a fear of me that she gonna do to me what I did to her. I run something called Shop Talk Live. I know that there's something that I can't do with talking. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know what it's gonna come down to, but... um. I have a fear that, and not even a fear, but a wariness and a caution that this all might be running its course. Mm. That it, 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 it all might be coming to, 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 to head pretty soon. Because once black people and indigenous people specifically, those two groups, black and indigenous people, once they begin to assert their value in a very practical way, white America ain't going to be able to take it. Right. It's going to shatter them. Right. And they're going to come apart. And it's going to be interpreted through a fear lens of retribution. But what does that really look like? Oh, you can name it. I mean, I mean, oh, okay, what, what is what really like? I need to be specific. I want you to say, like, what does it look like for black and indigenous people to take back or to... I, I'm not really sure, you know, because I yeah. want to... I mean, like, a, a lot of it right now is is... There is a resurgence of collective black capitalism being led by a guy named Boyce Watkins yep. by proxy of Claude Anderson. And yep. what it is is the idea that integration sapped the black community of its economic potential. And there's actually numbers to back that. What Jim Crow did at least have us have our own businesses. Because mm -hmm. yeah. you couldn't buy it from nobody else, right? right? And so in the absence of our own economic agency... We have been ghettoized. Right. Hmm. The black community didn't always used to be synonymous with ghetto. No. It used to be a thriving place that mm. just wasn't as wealthy as other places, mm -hmm. but there was safety. Mm -hmm. There was kindness. There mm -hmm. was children playing, mm -hmm. music being played. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? The black community used to be a thriving, bustling place. It wasn't always just rats. Right. And there's a, there's a push to get back to that. You know what I'm saying? And if you follow that uh, dog all the way to the end of that hunt, what it looks like is, is I, it's going to be, it's going to sound cliche, but it, it really do add up to a nation within a nation. Right. How is a nation within a nation different than a white ethno state? It's very simple. We're still subject to the laws of America. Mm. We're still subject to the currency of America. Still subject to elections. It's funny because the, the thing that was not allowed to happen was a black version of Chinatown. 
Mm-hmm. That's all brothers really wanted. Mm-hmm. Like, just Chinatown, you wouldn't call that a segregated community. No. You're like, mm, I'm going to get some dim sum over there. You're just going to go over there and this is where the Chinese folks be at. And it's not ghettoized. No. Nope. It's not polarized. Nope. It's not trashy. It's just a place where we do us. Oh my God. You're you, like blowing my mind right now. You, by you, the way. you know what I'm saying? Like, do you realize that that has never been allowed to happen? Right. That just a bustling black town? Like, my great grandpa, Billy Dow, he used to tell my, uh, my, my dad and auntie stories about Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Yes. Black Wall black Street. Street. He saw mm-hmm. it with his own two mm-hmm. eyes. Mm-hmm. Right. Big Billy Dow saw it with his own two eyes. Right. And that the place got burnt to the ground. And there was a bunch of black towns like that that started with momentum than a mega city like New York or Detroit has. We wonder what would happen if they were being allowed to thrive. Right. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't have to deal with ghettos and crack and crips and bloods and all this stuff. And that narrative is very much missing in the far white, uh, far right white supremacist circles. They just say, well, black people move in and property values go down. And I'm like, yo, if you knew that we were bombed out of prosperity, but, would but, you say that? You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. the, 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 the whole point is that, that that looks like us trying to own and control our own institutions to hopefully still be here and not get bombed the fuck out again. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Right. And so I want to say that Black Wall Street and the bombing mm-hmm. was not even the first of that. Yeah. I mean, we had waves of that. That's, mm-hmm. that's what, you know, when we had Reconstruction mm-hmm. and, and black right. folks owned land. 1870s. And black folks were senators and congressmen mm-hmm. and those people. That's where the Ku Klux Klan Organize and mm-hmm. burn shit down. I have ancestors who owned property, mm-hmm. and it just so happened that the Ku Klux Klan liked them, mm-hmm. so they warned them that we're coming for your property. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be there, or we're also going to kill you. Mm-hmm. Okay? And so if you go back to 1870, but if you go back to veterans, black veterans of World War I, if you go to black veterans of World War II, if you go to business people, part of what was happening is there have been, like you mm-hmm. said, places and times when black folks were successful, Together. but that was burned down and taken away. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Taken, taken away. And we have a long history. history of that. And it's a cycle of that. And, and it's, it's, it's which, which, which begs the question... What's going to stop it from happening again? Because when the Black Panthers saw that, oh, there's a military component that needs to happen. And they was like, well, we'll be that. They got prepared to deal with the police. And quiet as is kept, dealt effectively with them. Right. But the police are tied to a chain of force. Right. Systemic. Yeah. Right. The police is tied to the National Guard. Right. Tied to the Army. Tied to the intelligence agencies. Tied to the Air Force. You know what I'm saying? Right. So you can't just fight the police. Mm-hmm. Right. You got to fight the whole chain of the right. American and power. And the FBI starts which, investigating which, you which, and which, shut which, all which, that stuff down. Which then leads to the question, can we stay in America at all oh, and have I'm our needs met? You know what I'm saying? Be like, 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 follow the logic all the way. Like, follow that dog all the way to the end of that hunt. And you will see. Because to your point, I'm telling you, I've been hearing yo. there are African countries mm-hmm. who are saying, yo, black folks in America, come to Africa. But, but no, excuse me, what about half, half black people? Yeah. You, am I, black am is I black. allowed to go? Yo, black yo, y'all black. gonna go to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Africa's pretty diverse. There are people lighter than you mm-hmm. in Africa. Yeah. Well, any black colonized folks, right, place. Right, right, right. So, mm-hmm. so you know. What was you going to say? Like, my question yeah, is, we, we, does Richard Spencer like this conversation? Yeah. Does Richard Spencer <laughs> like watching that dog go to the end of the hunt and say, yes, we're arriving at the conclusion that we can't live together and that you guys need to leave? Hey, I'll be like, you going to miss me when I'm gone, Rich. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, 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 like Tina Turner, she really was the force behind Ike Turner anyway. Mm-hmm. She got abused and beat. And by the time I was born, I didn't know who Ike Turner was because Tina was so fucking glorious. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's like, I, right, you really think you want this? You mm-hmm. really think you want to live in a world without without all this rhythm? You really think you want to live in a world without all this swag? 
Right. right, you you really want to live in a world? Be where careful like, what you wish for. The, the right. motherfucking NFL, like like old boy at the gym who was like, "We want the war." Do you want that war? Because that war may not go the way you thought. It didn't right. go the way Goebbels thought it was gonna go. Right? Yeah, did it? You know, right. you know what I'm saying? It is well, funny and this is a my celebration of a. <laughs> Decisive loser. A decisive loser. Fascinating to me. Y'all, right. you, you, like, you celebrate yeah. Nazis and Confederates. Yeah. Well, all got but, the but, but, but let me talk about participation. Let me take it even further. <laughs> let me take it even further than where you just took it, Theo. And that is this. I'm like, be careful what you wish for, because what do you think? What do white folks think is going to happen if we waved a wand and all of a sudden? All the people of color were gone from America. Who the fuck do you think is going to do the work? All of a sudden, the Irish and the Italians and stuff will be back in the position that they were when they arrived here. Because mm-hmm. somebody's going to do that work. Somebody gonna be somebody's going to do that work. Somebody's going to be... Somebody's Guys, go- I'm scared. I think it's going to be the mixed race people. Well, you got to come. Think, are well, you going to let us come well, or well, what? Mean, I mean, look, you know, th- 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 this is all hypothetical and stuff. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We, 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 we ain't really flesh all of this out. But, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Oh no! I thought we had, I was no. taking notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. He bought his ticket. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean. Okay. Speaking of bought tickets, I went to Africa mm. while Ferguson was burning. Mm. I and America looked crazier from overseas than it does when you in it. Yeah, and, yeah. it does. And, it does. And, but, it does. But, but, but one of the things that one of the things that hit me mm. about Africa was that. I, especially South Africa because it's the most westernized portion of Africa I said I, I, first of all it's breathtaking mm. you leave the airport and it looked like Beverly Hills yeah. with nothing but black people Yeah, so much so that the, even the environment looked like Beverly Hills the, the semi-arid California mm-hmm. climate yeah. Yeah. the same kind of trees grow there yeah. all right. along with African vegetation all the roofs and shit yeah. look like Hollywood Everything's wow. in English, and the only thing that clued me that I wasn't in America was how many black folks there was, and the cars was on the wrong side of the fucking road. <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing that clued me that I wasn't in America. Okay. Yeah. But I, but but one of the things that hit me was like, you know what? Africans built this. Ain't nothing wrong with us. And it was like, why am I finally coming to the realization that ain't nothing wrong with us? Because even through my supposed black pride, I still be dealing with the fact, man, there's something wrong with us. You know what I'm saying? And I have to go to Africa to see, no, there's actually something very right with you. You know what I'm saying? That you could actually construct all of this. Like, the white folks didn't build that shit. That was apartheid. They weren't going to build none of that shit. Right. You know what I'm saying? They don't have the manpower to build that. They were only uh, one-eighth of the population. Right. So, you know what I'm saying? The bottom line was that, okay, I was like, okay, we can do whatever the fuck we want to do. All right, wait. So, what we're saying is, we're about to move back to Africa. Is that what's happening? We're gonna try to make it work. We're gonna try to build the world that we can build here. Whatever. I'm not moving tomorrow. Yeah, like I know. I'm like, no, like, man. Like, your contract. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, 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 like yeah. straight up. I'm. I got to give what I believe is the highest road a chance first. Right. Mm. I got to give the highest road a chance first. Us moving back to Africa don't change the zero sum game. Right. That's right. Well, I feel like Liberia indicates yeah. that pretty. Strong. But now li- 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 Liberia also had an issue of you sending black folks back who all they knew was slavery. Yeah. So right. of course they perpetuated the shit because they traumatized. That's all they know. Right. But at the same time, us just up and moving back to Africa don't change the zero sum game. That's a global Not resource at all. challenge right now. Right. Not at, you at all. all. Me? So that to me is the highest road. Let's change the resource game. I believe some kind of crypto blockchain based on food rather than gold, based on life and human energy rather than oil. Mm. Could actually like you could actually build something that looks like a currency, even what looks like a cryptocurrency that's not even based in the fiat currencies of the governments of the world, but actually on national uh, natural resources. And since everybody gets to look at look into the blockchain situation, mm-hmm. just know there's all transparency, and you could just make something like that. See, that's something that I think 
I think a lot of minds will get on board with. And white minds, black minds, Asian, Latino minds, you name it. Everybody got a good mind. Genius is the property of all the human race. Mm-hmm. So you that that to me is actually the longest term solution. I got to give that a try first and at least start putting... Every talk I go right. to, every right. speech I give, Right. I say let's engineer a world where we have a new set of problems. Fuck these problems. Right. You know what I'm saying? Let's get a new set of problems. All right? By engineering these current ones out of existence. It's an engineering issue. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But not a social issue or nothing like that. It's a it's a straight up. Who gets what and how. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then... But if, but if the motherfuckers don't get on board with that, I got to ride with my folks. Because yeah. these motherfuckers have categorized me as black whether I want to be or not. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? And that's mm-hmm. the truth. That's the closest I can get to an accurate assessment of the world I live in. Wow. Mm. You know? Oh, my God, Theo. Mm. Thank you so much no for coming over here, dropping your wisdom, your knowledge, and being willing to participate in some of my particular nonsense. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was wondering, I know you're a poet. Would you grace us with a piece? Possibly. It's got a little rap I used to do. It's called Struggle Beautifully. Oh. All right, lay Uh-oh. it on us. Lay it on But uh, it's, 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 it's a rap that I turned into a poem when I started slamming. It's like I float alone on this ocean made of blood and illusions and drink from the genocide because I love the confusion. My soul is bruised with contusions because I'm black and turned out. Through my abuse of conclusions I lack are backing me down. It's hard to rise when I stay higher than our poverty rate. Speed down the road of life where I'm from and you'll probably break. It's all on my face. I'm gobbled up by common mistakes. Play devil's advocate because me and mama God don't relate. You take a breath and let me take you on a passionate ride. Through my soul's hurricanes and get trapped in the eyes of this hot-blooded, fire-breathing, passionate lover. Skull-cracking heathen, even bad motherfucker. Flawed prophet all rolled into one. Read the Quran, meditate, steady rolling the blunt. I'm every black man trying to get some air, but I'm asthmatic. Mm. Got a damn good mind, hella bad habits. But we black, half African and half amazing. Mm. Laughing through the aftermath and happy on the path I'm blazing. We struggle hard way back, but we never stop hoping. Whip cut a slave's back and he bled pop culture. Mm. From blues to hip hop, nothing stopping us now. But this blind generation that can topple us down. We too gangster for the truth, fuck it, give me a lie. I'll hang a picture up of Malcolm in my pimp ride. But if my people die for lack of knowledge, how is ignorance bliss? We die of thirst along the Nile, don't know the river exists. Not knowing that the root of ignorance is ignored. We turn to beggars with our pockets full of riches galore. Guess that's the way of our kind when our vision is blind. Fighting this nemesis that's killing us invisibly, but enemy mind whose identity I'm beginning to find. Been a man in the mirror since near the beginning of time. Thank you. Whoa. Mm. Damn. Wow. Wow. Mm. Thank you. No, no, no. Thank, thank you. you. So, and, thank you. And Theo, where can we catch you on social media, et cetera? Yes, Theo uh, EJ Wilson is my uh, social media page. I just got a Theo Wilson, too. That's my personal page. TheoEJWilson.com. And my TED Talk is on TED.com. Just type in my name. Um, All right. And I only have one more question for you. What's up? Um, did you like my poem that I... <laughs> yeah, I liked your poem. Oh, yo, I, yo, I actually did. Because it was mad. So wait a minute. We got to let the audience know what you're talking about, right? Yeah. You came to... I went to the, the Casbah. The, right. right. The, the, the Renaissance first and third Thursdays at 8 o'clock. We be doing the poetry. Casbah, Six and Chambers. Aurora. I, I liked your emotional honesty. You were very transparent. You told a story that had a beginning, middle, and end. And it was one that had everybody captivated. I was listening and there wasn't a whole, there wasn't no talking. Everybody was into your story and it was just like, this person is sharing their truth. So I believe that you share an effective and compelling work of art. Wow, I agree. You guys heard it here. Theo Wilson said, (laughs) I shared effective and compelling art.